when I look back through history and consider all the sacrifices in every war and I try to grasp it all, come to grips with it, stand in reverence of all those willing to give their lives for something bigger than themselves, I am stunned by the sheer numbers. All those lives, all those families serving their country I can't always comprehend it my heart is not big enough to take it all in that each one didn't come home what they lost for their service what we gained for their courage today I stop to remember every single number is one soldier one sailor who got up in the morning and put on a uniform one marine who answered the call to fight for freedom, one airman who knew the cost and went anyway, one man or woman who paid the ultimate price for many, and the freedom I live in now. Today, I remember. Heavenly Father, we realize today that we have much to be grateful for, a nation that is blessed, a nation that enjoys freedom, liberty, a nation that has been given so much. We realize that that also lays upon us a responsibility. Lord, today we're so grateful for those who paid the ultimate price to help this country what it is. Lord, we ask that you would use each of us to proclaim that same kind of liberty and freedom with uh, every day that we're given as a gift. We, today we remember. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite you to stand. Let's worship together um, as a congregation, as a group of people eager uh, to just bless the Lord together.
Father, we come before you this morning, and we're so thankful with grateful hearts for sending your son, Jesus. Father, as we declared in this song, we come to the altar. We come with the voice of praise and thanksgiving. Thank you, Jesus, for being obedient to the Father's will and giving up your life as a sacrifice for ours in place. And so we give you our lives in return, Lord Jesus, and ask you to have your way in our lives today. Father, I pray for the marriages that may be in this room that are going through a rough patch. Father, that you just begin to mend and heal and restore trust and faithfulness, Lord. For those of us in here that need a healing touch, maybe body aches and pains, Father, we pray that through the sacrifice and the blood of what Jesus did on the cross and his resurrection, that there's healing provided. And we believe that today, and we confess that, Lord. And, Father, as we remember this weekend our military, those that have given their lives for our country, and those that continue to fight, Father, so we can have the freedom to come and worship and lift up your mighty name, Jesus, and to declare to people how awesome Jesus is, we pray a hedge of protection them as well. Be 
be with family this weekend that are out traveling and visiting other family, Lord Jesus. We just pray that you will surround them and protect them and just give them a time of refreshing. And for those of us here, Father, that are just spending the weekend here with our family and our loved ones, just bring refreshing, Lord. We say all these things, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, turn and say hi to someone really quick. Yeah. And I just want to welcome everybody that's watching online. We hope that you are making yourself at home as you're watching here at Elevation Church. It's good. <laughs> no, I just wanted to make sure I'm greeting them. Hey. And then I'll just welcome everyone. Okay. All right. As, as you find your seats, I just want to welcome everyone here to Elevation Church. We are so blessed and honored that you've come to visit us. We don't believe anybody walks through our doors by accident. And so we just want you to feel at, well, at home as you're visiting. If this is your first time here, we have a gift for you. So as you walk out the doors, make sure you stop by and say hi to um, our information. I'll probably be there. Some of our staff will be there. Say hi, and we have a gift for you. And I'm just going to go ahead and have Pastor Matt come on up. Awesome. We're, we're calling a little bit of an audible here. Uh, we've got some video announcements in a second, but if I could, I'd like to have the Patzer family join us up here. Um, they're actually moving to Florida, and they've been here for, I want to say, nine years? Nine years. Right before I came, they got here. So um, we just wanted to uh, honor you, and as a matter of fact, uh, they're going, he's running a, um, a coffee shop on Cocoa Beach, right? Yeah, Cocoa Beach. Cocoa Beach, Florida. So, uh, Leah, would you come on up to, um, and so they, they gave us some coffee uh, today. This is actually fantastic coffee. <laughs> my, uh, my brother-in-law bought 20 pounds of it. 20, 20, 20 pounds. 20 pounds. He had one cup of this at our house, and he bought 20 pounds of this coffee. So if you're a coffee drinker, uh, I just want you to know you can, you can find it online at the Juice and Java Cafe, Cocoa Beach, Florida, and you can order some more coffee. But uh, more than that, um, I just want to say how much it's been, it's been amazing for my wife and I to see all that God has done in and through your lives, your kids, and, and you as leaders, as parents, and uh, I can remember, I remember over nine years ago, standing in line with you uh, to go see the journey to Bethlehem, and it was the first time that we'd met uh, the Patzer family, and they had just moved from uh, Wyoming, and they, they came here, and they're like, wow, this place is packed. We're a little nervous, right? And John actually looked at me and he goes, I really don't like people at all, and I don't know how I'm going to live here. <laughs> I was like... You know, he's, he was used to a little more land, <laughs> a little more space. But, so, so John and Hildy got involved in a small group, and, and because of COVID, our, our groups have had to take a pause, but they got involved in a small group. They began studying God's Word. Not only that, they began to get involved in ministry. Talk a little bit about uh, the Jules ministry that you were able to be part of here. All right, so I can do it. I got this. So um, <laughs> Jules is an awesome ministry where we go into an unteached, unreached people group. Yeah. Um, we go into adult entertainment clubs, yeah. and we show that the ladies that work there that Jesus loves them no matter where they're at. Well, Correction. The males walk the ladies to the door. The ladies go in, and they show that Jesus loves them right where they're at. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, but he runs security outside the building, yeah. making sure people were safe. Uh, and then, but most importantly, praying. Praying in, in, that there would be opportunities, uh, encounters. So some of you uh, have been part of this ministry, too, where... We'll watch uh, children uh, for the girls. As a matter of fact, we throw a big Christmas banquet 
for everybody. Uh, your, you guys and your giving provides a Christmas banquet, and then we invite him to come back for Christmas Eve. I'll never forget the year one of the girls walked up and uh, put an offering. We were doing our offering in the manger, and she walked up and put her offering in the manger. It was pretty cool. Yeah, we, we were touched their lives to the fact that when they had crisis, they actually contacted us at the church. I mean, so that's a ministry we walked for seven years. Yeah. And we get to take it to Florida with us. So they're going to reinitiate. Yeah. So, so that will be awesome. Not only that, but he's involved with a, a brand new church plant in Florida. The name of the church? The Point. The Point. And he's going to be helping uh, launch a brand new ministry there um, and in men's ministry. And so it's really exciting to see how God has opened the door and allowing you guys uh, to really serve. I just want you to know how much we love you. And uh, it's great that you're moving to a vacation spot because <laughs> we're planning on invading your home sometime in August. Uh, any, as anytime, time, it's any, open. Anytime. Do you hear that? So bed and breakfast, Cocoa Beach, can't go uh, wrong with that, right? Good It'd coffee. be fantastic and great coffee in the morning. Listen, um, it's been so great uh, to have you part of this community, and, and uh, we'd like to pray a blessing over you. Um, Leah, would, would you mind praying, and then I'll pray as well. Um, we're excited to see what God's going to do in and through you. We're sending you as missionaries to a vacation Hot spot. How about that? Sure. Okay, okay. And thank right. you to Hildy for many, many years of faithfully leading in the women's Bible study groups. A lot yeah. of you have had her as a leader, and we thank you. Yeah. I'm not sure I should do this part. Okay. <laughs> no, but I said that about John because uh, um, I think you guys have had an amazing journey. Um, I'm not sure that many people love people more than you do. Yeah. And you actually told me nine I don't years like ago that you didn't even <laughs> like people. <laughs> so I just, it's been so fun, I think, yeah. for us to see the huge transformation in your lives. And yeah, um, yeah we're just super excited for you. Now he smiles at people and gives them coffee and, you know, yeah, he does. I, yeah. I just want to thank Elevation. I mean, this is the first church that I have been involved in in my life that has been family. Mm. Some of it have just selflessly given. And also loved us back. Mm. Thank you. And also I want to extend a special thank you to the Rops. Just for the last. <laughs> John went to Florida in October. And just thank you guys for opening your house, opening your hearts to my family and I while he was well, during this transition. I couldn't have made it without you. Thank you. Awesome. All right, well, let's pray here. Dear Lord, we pray for John and Hildy and Lee and Liz as they begin this new adventure, that you would go before them, that you would make their path straight, that you would give them opportunities, even um, already ones that they just never even thought possible. We thank you for blessing them financially with providing a home for them there, and we just pray as they begin to put down roots and connect in that community that you would just give them uh, many, many ways to connect with people at the coffee shop and the new church that they're going to be working in and with the um, the unseen part of the community, God, that they were so um, important here, even in that ministry, God, that you would reach to those who are not always seen. And um, we thank you for their hearts, for those people, for um, the hard work that they put in, for staying up all night many, many times with jewels like... Um, the hours that they put in. We thank you for Lee and Liz. We thank you for Liz as she just graduated, that you would direct her steps as she works towards her welding degree and then and is separated from her family for a little while, that you would give her, um, help us to support her as she stays here for these next few months. And for Lee, as he starts high school in a new place, that you would give him great friends, that you would um, provide just a community for him and um, a lot of connection quickly, that you would just protect, protect them and guide them each step of the way as they go to Florida. Lord, thank you for what you have in front of them. This brand new chapter of lives that are going to be touched, of the kingdom of God advancing into the hearts of people. 
we just thank you and look back in awe at what you do in the hearts and lives of a family and how you use this family to bring kingdom change into this community. And we invite you to do it there too. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Can you give them a big round of applause? Love you, man. Love you. Love you, Love you buddy. Awesome. Well, we have a, a few announcements uh, for you to take a look at here on the video screen. And uh, then we'll go into our message, okay? Take a look at this. Next Sunday for all of our kids is Move Up Sunday. Yes, Move Up. New classes, new teachers, big giveaways, prizes, everything you don't want to miss. The only thing that stays the same is Jesus. That's right. Our E-Kids Summer XP is coming up very soon and we couldn't be more excited. XP, what's that all about? It's an exceptional, exciting experience. It's not too late to register. And if you're wanting to help, donations are due today. So there's still time to run to the store, grab the donation item and bring it back before service ends. Yes. Also next weekend on Saturday, starting at 10, we're gonna have a work day where we set up the whole thing. So bring your, bring muscles. your muscles. And Sunday after service, we're gonna continue to set things up. Great, it'll be awesome. Looking forward to seeing you there. Youth camp is two weeks away. We're so excited. If you have any questions or need a registration form or a packing list, please email me uh, here and I will get you those. And then we also have our Brave Kids Camp registration, which is due June 6th. You can pick those up at the Welcome Center and it is July 18th through the 20th for every child entering either third through sixth grade. So that's third through sixth graders coming up next year. Get your registrations in. And one of the things that we're wanting to do is to create more opportunities for us to connect as a community. So this summer, we're launching Dinners for Eight, where you can sign up online and be put in a group with eight other people. Over the course of the summer, about two months, we're gonna get together and do four activities. I'm hoping my group goes to the Red Iguana. I'm hoping we go to the Cheesecake Factory. Anyway, sign up online and you'll be put with a group of eight other people. It gives us that opportunity to reconnect as a community. You can sign up through the app or the website. And if you're in my group, please bring probably about twice the amount of food because I can really pack it down. Twice the amount. That was fun. I need to do announcements more often. I've been telling you that. I know you have, Cole. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I did announcements for probably 25 years uh, of being a staff pastor, and so uh, I always thought that it was the very worst job possible. Um, we, we tried everything. We tried, no one ever listens to announcements, you know. So we tried everything. We did Saturday Night Live sketch, uh, sketches and all kinds of stuff to try and get people to watch. But anyway, well, there's a lot of stuff going on, and uh, we're excited about what God's going to do this summer. Um, for those of you who are uh, here maybe for the first time checking us out, um, we're, we're in a series uh, that we've been calling uh, Finding Your Way Back to God. I don't know about you, but through the whole COVID season, Sometimes you feel like life has been put on hold, and uh, hopefully our connection and relationship with Jesus hasn't been put on hold, but we want to just talk about different ways that we can find our way back to God. And what we've done over the last several weeks is trace several movements that we've seen in the, pro the story of the prodigal son. Uh, we saw how he came to his senses. He then realized that he needed rescue. He discovered that it was through his father that he could have healing and wholeness and answers and new life purpose. And then we saw how when he came back to his father, God reworks his identification, his personal perception of himself. And so then we've moved into different spiritual practices. There are spiritual disciplines that help connect us, keep us connected to the life of God. And we've looked at several, uh, fasting, giving, uh, scripture study and meditation, 
uh, the power of the Holy Spirit last week on Pentecost Sunday. And so today, we're going to wrap up our series talking about prayer. I need to confess to you that this has been a rather convicting week (laughs) as I've been looking at prayer and what prayer is and how God calls us to prayer. And I'll confess that this is an area, even in my own, in my own life, that I really need to work on. Um, I'll just tell you that prayer is something that is work. It's actually work, hard work to pray. And uh, some of us are oftentimes afraid of hard work. We're really good at collecting stimulus checks from God. Uh, but oftentimes we're not willing to put the work in uh, to really see God move in his kingdom advance. I can remember uh, when I was in college, this is several years ago, uh, my younger brother Andy, uh, he's now a pastor in Nashville, Tennessee, um, at a a big church there. Um, But I can remember him experiencing a lot of pain. Uh, We went and took him to the doctor And the doctor uh, let us know that he had cancer. There were literally hundreds of tumors all through his body. His lymphatic system was full of tumors. Uh, As a matter of fact, he had one probably the size of a softball that was sitting on top of his left lung, and he was having trouble breathing. Uh, We did a lot of things um, medically, but also spiritually to try and see God work a miracle in his life. I can remember hearing um, through the grapevine that there was going to be a healing minister in the city of Chicago, and so he drove into the city, he began to speak, and he made this claim uh, at the end of his message. He said, if you give uh, $7 for every person of the Holy Spirit, the doctor's scalpel will never touch your body. And my brother was on a gurney being rolled in to the surgery, and he kind of looked up at my dad while he was laying on the gurney. He said, Dad, I wish I'd have had that $21. There's a lot of questions that we come to when we think about prayer. As a matter of fact, I think sometimes we wonder if prayer even works. Have you ever wondered that? I, I have. Um, God asks us to pray, and I have trouble praying, but God healed my brother. I still remember uh, the, the moment we were in his room in the hospital and the doctor put up the scans of his body before all the treatment and after the treatment. And here's what the oncologist, the big fancy oncologist at Northwestern University in Chicago said, this is absolutely astounding. I can't believe the recovery that he's had and how the tumors are totally gone. You put them up on the window, and I look back at that, uh, that guy's made more money than all of us ever will, right? I look back at that doctor, and I said to him, I said, this is a miracle. This is the power of God. The power of God did this. And, you know, of course, there are some doctors who have a God complex, and they feel like it's them, but he said, I, I can't believe the astounding recovery. It was just amazing. And then I remember the day, um, and, and that, that shape, moments like that shape us, right? That God does answer prayer in that when we pray, God can do some incredible things. And I remember um, going to the first church that I was a pastor. It was actually the church that my wife grew up in, and I was pastoring there. Um, and a, a dear friend of mine, his name is Bob Ray, that I really looked up to and admired his gentle, quiet spirit, his humility. He was a veteran from Vietnam, and he would travel on the weekends and sing. Um, he was part of a music group that just brought encouragement all over the country, and he wound up getting diagnosed with cancer, and it was just all through him. And I, I was like, okay, God, you're going to show up again. You're going to heal him. And I can remember those moments where we'd go over to his house, and we'd have, I mean, have you ever been part of fervent prayer meetings where it's just like, and sometimes, you know, we think God hears us a little better if we have more volume, um, or if it's, it's more from our, our, our heart. and our So we had moments like that, but the Lord took Bob. And uh, I, that really shook me to the core, that God didn't heal Bob Ray. So I have, you know, my brother who's healed. I have Bob who died. And then my father gets diagnosed with Alzheimer's. 
And, um, you know, he's been gone now, well, physically gone for over three years. But I can remember praying, God, I know you can, you can do a miracle. You can bring my father's mind back. And guess what? He has. God has brought his mind back. As a matter of fact, I can remember uh, thinking and reflecting as my father had passed away, God brought a verse to my mind. And the verse was that now we know in part, but then we will know fully as we're fully known. And, and the Lord brought that scripture to me and it, it brought such comfort to my heart. But then the enemy starts digging on us. Have you ever had that happen where in your, in your mind the enemy starts digging and, and this, is, this is really what he whispered to me. The enemy whispers stuff. He's like, that's not true. You thought of that on your own. You know God's word. You just, you just went to that verse to try and give yourself false hope. Well, we wound up coming back here to Utah in a beautiful family, uh, friends of ours. They don't even attend the church. They brought a meal over to our house, and inside a card was written that verse. Now we know in part, but then we will know fully, even as we're fully known. And God said, I gave you that verse. Just in case you were confused, I gave you that verse. So I don't know about you, there's these moments where we have this incredible pain where, where we don't see answered prayer in our life. And then there are these other moments where we see these incredible miracles that God brings, and it kind of is a head-scratcher to me. It, it's confusing to me, and part of that it has caused me to maybe not pray as much as I should. And the enemy wants to use unanswered prayer to block us from praying. Today, I want us to think a little bit about prayer and how prayer connects you to Jesus. How when you pray, you connect with him. Isn't that cool that you can connect with Jesus? And he wants us to be able to do that. So there's a difference between the reasons why we pray and the outcomes of prayer. And I can remember years ago being in an Alpha course, and I had in that Alpha course, I had a Hindu a Muslim, an atheist, an agnostic, and a Jew, and one other Christian besides me. And we were talking about prayer, and we just threw out this question, how would you define prayer? And the agnostic said, well, I think prayer is more about changing me than circumstances. And I thought that was an amazing understanding, that prayer is something that actually changes me. Sometimes it's not even about the circumstance. And so for the longest time, I've been like, okay, so prayer changes me. But guess what? I don't get up at 2 o'clock in the morning so that I can change me or God can change me. Does that make sense? I mean, I'll get up at 2 o'clock in the morning if someone's trying to break into my house. But I won't get up at 2 o'clock in the morning so that God can change me. I'm just being honest. I'll get up at 7 and let him change me, right? But the point is that sometimes God will, God will do something in us and, and, and draw us into prayer. So what really is prayer all about? And I want to tell you today, if you forget everything else, here's what I want you to remember. God needs you to pray. God needs you to pray. We're going to talk about that because I know right now you're like, what? God doesn't need me to pray. He's on the move. God's on the move. He's doing all this kind of stuff. But that's, that's really not the way God is. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. I think this has been so profound uh, for me this week to, to discover this. But here are reasons why we pray. We, we pray so that we can connect to God. We pray because we want to get answers. We pray because we're demonstrating our dependence on Him. Our inability in and of ourselves to accomplish anything. And then the outcomes of prayer, here, here's what happens when we pray. The kingdom of God expands. The kingdom of God expands. And prayer changes me, but it also moves the mighty hand of God. Your prayer moves the very hand of God. Here's, here's kind of where I'm going with this. If you look throughout Scripture you're going to see a lot of conditional statements in regard to prayer. Um, 
if-then statements. Do you realize this, that the Bible has a lot of if-then statements? If you pray, then I'll do this. Why would God just not do it? Why would God just not do it? Why does he want us to pray? I believe it's because we have a great God. And this God demonstrates to us his power by allowing us to share in it. He allows us to be part of what he's doing. And we create in our minds often the image of what God is. And I think the Avengers has had a lot to do with that. Uh, Greek mythology, uh, also uh, some, some of these ideas. Uh, Thor is another one, you know, like this incredible power that he wields, right? And he can come and rescue and win any situation. Or Zeus, I actually walked uh, where Zeus's temple was in Greece. And of course, it's all fallen down. They had an earthquake and it's all gone now. But um, that temple must have been such a powerful presence. And our concept and idea of power is very different than God's uh, concept of power and the way he demonstrates power on our planet. And, and so for us, power is uh, Hill Air Force Base, the F-35 fighter plane that can take you out, boom, just like that. Or the F-22 that creates air superiority so that our ground troops can do their work. Um, we think of power that way. Power is the ability to destroy. And we hold that over our world. And that's how we keep our world safe, right? So to, to us, that's the idea of power. But God's concept of power is totally different than that. And what God does with his power is he gets inside you and he changes you from the inside out. He doesn't force you to change. He doesn't demand that you change. He doesn't hold Thor's hammer over your head and say change. That's what I'd like to be able to do to get my guys to clean their room. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that at all. But instead, what he does is he changes us from the inside out. And so God's concept and idea here of power is directly connected to these if-then statements about prayer. I want to show you one that's probably the most famous, and I'm sure you've heard of this, and it usually gets brought up only around election time, but it should be something that we, uh, we anchor our heart and life to every day. And here's what it is, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, and it's got an if-then condition. Then, if, right? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins and restore or heal their land. Do you see that? If you'll humble yourself, if you'll pray, if you'll turn from your wicked ways, then I will forgive and heal. Don't you want God to do that? in your family, in your home, in this world. Yes, 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 God. So are we praying? Or am I going to go home and watch the jazz win again? Now, I'm going to do that, right? <laughs> you guys have totally warped me and brought me from the Chicago Bulls failure of a franchise. I'm now a Utah Jazz fan. <laughs> I'm just telling you, I'm going public. This is online being pumped. To go. The bulls are terrible. Get, get with it, guys. Or, and maybe I'll come back, but probably not, because these jazz are fun to watch, man. They're awesome. But anyway, we're up two to one. Another game, and then we got them on the ropes, right? Okay. Um, sorry, I really digress. I, forgive me for that. So here's this, this picture, this conditional thing that God has with prayer. What is he doing with this? Here's, here's another one, uh, James chapter 5, verse 16. I want you to see this. This is really, really interesting, okay? James 5, 16, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed, okay? So there's other things involved in this. There's confession, there's prayer, so that you may be heal healed. And then here's this, this next section is what I want to kind of focus on. It says, the 
earnest prayer, other translations call it the fervent prayer, all right, or the effective prayer, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Here's what, here's what James is doing. He's the half-brother of Jesus. Here's what he's doing in this passage. In the Greek, I don't normally talk about the Greek because, you know, I've forgotten everything I studied. But if you look at this in the Greek, James is using the same word for earnest and produces wonderful things. It's the exact same Greek word. So what's he saying? He's saying that you're the energy behind your prayer is directly connected to the wonderful and powerful results that come about because of your prayer. The energy of your prayer, the fervency of your prayer is directly connected to the powerful result that God brings out. Now, what in the world is going on? E.M. Bounds, who, uh, he's an old guy, dead and gone, but he wrote a book on prayer, and here's what he said. God shapes the world by prayer. The more praying there is in the world, the better the world will be, the mightier the forces against evil. Isn't that cool? The idea here is that my prayer, my energy into this, that what I put into this is a direct result to what comes out. When Jesus was with his disciples, he's training these guys to be kingdom builders. And they're going out into these places, and there's a large crowd, right, that gathers at the foot of a mountain, and a man comes up and kneels before Jesus, and here's what he says. Have mercy on my son. If you're a dad, you know know what that prayer is. Have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly, often he'll fall into fire or water. Imagine how this dad never had rest because he was always watching for his boy. He said, I brought my son to your disciples and they couldn't heal him. They couldn't do it. And Jesus responds to this man and here's what he says. There are some things that only happen because of much prayer and fasting. Isn't that interesting? There are some strongholds that can only be broken through much prayer and fasting. Jesus is inviting us to be part of this process. Now, Jesus has a theology of prayer. I want you to see what Jesus says and how he's teaching us to pray. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 10, here's what he says. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here's our problem. Are you ready? Here's the problem. We think his will has already been done. Guess what? It hasn't. His full and complete and perfect will for you is still unfolding, right? We're not in his perfect and complete and perfect will for us right now. And we think that it's already happened. But what Jesus is doing is he's saying, I want you to acknowledge God in his authority, in his holiness, and then I want you to pray. And I want you to pray this way, that his will be done and that his kingdom would come. I want you to do it. Now that to me is mind-boggling. What it is is a picture of a good God who invites you in to what he's doing You see, all other gods that we create in our own image, it's about them and their power and their authority. But what Jesus has done is he's laid all that down and he's invited us to be part of this process. And here's here's what it means to be powerful. And I want you to see this because I think this captures it in in a beautiful way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, here's what it says. Here's what, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'll just read it. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, 
It is the power of God. The crucified Christ is the power of God. Now that doesn't make sense, does it? That Christ dying on a cross is more powerful than the empire that's putting him to death. That's, what, that's the truth, the reality. And all of us look at that and we think that's absolute foolishness. This, this guy is dying on a cross. How is that a picture of power? It's a picture of power because the crucified Christ is not only God's power, but it's God's wisdom. It's his perfect plan. Here's what it says in 1 Corinthians 1 as we continue in verse 23. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, right? Cursed is anyone who's on a tree, and foolishness to the Gentiles. That's absolutely ridiculous. That is not a demonstration of power. That's foolishness. God has called both Jews and Greeks, uh, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. From a human point of view, it makes absolutely no sense that this is any picture of power at all. But what Paul says, it's the power of God. As a matter of fact, Jesus on the cross, and I'm not going to do this well because I don't have much. Jesus on the cross is God flexing his muscle, showing his power. His power is a sacrificial, undeniable, unstoppable love for his enemy. That's the power of God. That Christ on the cross disarms evil and darkness in man's idea and concept of what evil, uh, of what power really is. This is the only power that can change someone from the inside out. It is a self-sacrificial power of God that changes everything. That's Christ on the cross. God's omnipotence and his power is so different than what we think. He doesn't just snap a finger and change things. But what he does is he gets into your heart. And he changes the way you think. He changes the way you see. He changes the way you understand the world. He changes your concept and idea of what your purpose in life is. He changes everything about you from the inside out. And that is what true power is. You can't legislate it. You can't march an army to cause it to happen. But what he does is he gets into your heart because of his love for you. And he lays down everything. He emptied himself of everything to become a servant and became obedient unto death on the cross. And that changes it all. And that won my heart. That changed me. And that's what God wants to do in and through us. This is the true God who actually shares authority and influence with us. He allows us to influence how things actually go. I'll say it again. He allows us to influence how things actually go. He submits to us, gives to us authority, and then invites us to submit it back to him, and then he goes to work. That's what he does. And as you love and connect with God, his will is poured out. He's given his authority and power away. You see, we're created in God's image. And what that means is you are a literal representation and you are designed to reflect God in every place you touch. That's what it means to be the image of God. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells you that you are a king or a queen. You represent him and you have his authority. And and, and that's here on earth and you are to carry out his will. You're to love the way he loved. There's a power and energy that's released through your prayers. And Jesus gives you that authority. He declares over you that you are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. A people who's proclaimed to declare his light in a world that's darkness. You're fellow workers with God. Have you noticed that in the scripture? That you are a fellow worker with God. God's like, dude, let's go. Let's go to work. As a matter of fact, we see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. For we are, I'm just going to go quick, we are God's workers. 
fellow workers is, is the actual in the Greek. In, in 2 Corinthians 6 verse 1, it says, as God's partners, your partner with God, the creator of the universe has invited you to partner with him to push his kingdom and his way forward. And I, I think this verse is great. As God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it, but get on your knees and pray and bring it about. That's what, it's all, that's what God's calling us to do. And so he wants us to exercise this authority in our life. He says, you didn't choose me, but I chose and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So whatever you ask in the Father, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. If then, if you pray, then I will open up the windows of heaven. Will you say yes and agree with him? Will you say yes and invite him to do something amazing even today? I want to invite the worship team to come as they're coming. I really, I really feel today that what, what God would like to do is to turn this place into, uh, into a place of power, a place of God's power being released. I'm going to list off a few things in prayer over this message. The Lord has just kind of, reve- kind of revealed or sh- shown a light on uh, that I, I believe that God wants us to pray against uh, several spirits of our, of our time and of our age. First, there's a spirit of confusion. There's a spirit of confusion among our young people today about identity and who they are. Even with adults who think that they're a jazz fan, but really I'm a child of the king, right? That's what defines me, right? So there's a spirit of confusion, and we grab on to all these things to identify and define ourselves. This is who I am. But this spirit of confusion is gone because God is not the author of confusion, but he is one who brings truth, love, and a sound mind. There's another spirit that I think has taken a hold here in the United States of America, I know right here in Utah, the spirit of anxiety and depression its taken the lives of some of the people that we love most dear. But there's a spirit of anxiety and depression. But we are called to cast our cares on him because he cares for us. There's also all around us a spirit of religion. And what God wants to do is to confront the spirit of religion this way, that salvation is not by works, but it's by grace through faith. That's, that's, that's how salvation comes. But I think more than anything, there's a spirit of deception. The lies of the world, the lies of the deceiver are on the rise. They are. <laughs> and we need to push that back. Because God's given us the spirit of truth. So here's what I'd like you to do. Maybe one of those four things kind of touched your heart. And we're going to worship. Feel free to to sing. And with this environment of singing, I love this unplugged kind of laid back uh, thing we're doing today. Thank you. But here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to pray fervently. Um. I think it's probably an oxymoron to say, uh, it's, it's a little bit ironic to say pray fervently just to the end of the service. But at least we can, get, we can get a start, right? But what I'd like you to do is to create prayer huddles. And the person that you're sitting next to is a, a fellow king that Jesus has touched, that he's put his finger on. Maybe you want to pray in a prayer huddle with your family if you're gathered here. And one of those things, a spirit of confusion, a spirit of anxiety or depression or a spirit of religion or the the deception and lies, you want to come against those. And you just want to lift your voice and out loud say, "I'm, I'm praying against this. I want to invite you to make little prayer huddles, maybe four or five, six people. Maybe it's your your family. Maybe you're here and you just, you need a group, just go make a group. But as we're worshiping, I want to invite you to begin to pray because as we pray, strongholds come down. As you pray, as you pray, maybe there's a stronghold in your family that you're just believing God to 
to get rid of, okay? So enough talking. I'm done talking. Let's, let's pray. Do you know why? The future depends on your prayer. And that's our problem. For so, so long, I've thought it didn't matter. I pray and my brother gets healed and my dad dies. It didn't matter. It does matter. <laughs> it does matter. And we need to have faith that it does matter. That our prayers make a difference for eternity. And as you pray, you're connecting with the power of Jesus to bring change to our world. Are you ready to do that today? Do you believe you can do that today? Jesus said, I give you what authority I have. I give you. <laughs> All right? So let's, uh, you can either stay seated or you can stand however you want, but let's, let's make some prayer huddles today. Maybe there's something totally different that you want to pray about. Just tell your huddle. Say, I want to pray about this. All right? Deal? We're all friends here. Cool? All right, let's do it.
Jesus, we thank you so much for the privilege to just partner with you. We're fellow workers with you. You never stop. You never quit. You continue to work to bring out good in the, in the face of evil. And so, God, together as a community, we lift up to you. We cry out to you with a sense of fervency on behalf of our children. Lord, we realize that beginning next week, we're going to have kids all throughout this building. And we pray in the name of Jesus that you would allow them to encounter you. That every child who's part of this camp that we do will sense the incredible love that God has for them. That he sees them, he notices them, that, that they matter to you. God, would they encounter Jesus the crucified Jesus, the power and wisdom of God, that they would, in, in whatever capacity their, their minds can understand, would they, would they discover and awaken to your reality. And God, in, in the name of Jesus, we rebuke the attack on our kids, that the lies from the very pit of hell that are after them to steal and draw them away from the truth and reality of who you are, and so, God, we pray that every lie would be broken. Every stronghold that's built against the knowledge of God will be torn down by the goodness and power of Jesus. And that we would be open to receive that into our hearts and into our lives. God, I pray that today would be a marker point in many of our lives. That we would embrace and step into the amazing challenge to begin to pray the kingdom of God into our homes, into our kids, into our neighborhoods, our community, the whole state of Utah, that from this very state, the greatest move of God in our generation would, would be seen. And it would impact and change the world. God, we know that's your heart. And God, we pray it would be so. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Guess what? It matters. It matters that you pray. Dads, it matters that you pray for your kids. God bless you. Have an amazing week. See you next Sunday.